The Dirt with me, Mike Howell, an economics podcast where I present the down and dirty agronomic science to help grow crops and bottom lines. Inspired by economics.com, farming's go-to informational resource, I'm here to break down the latest crop nutrition research, news, and issues, helping farmers make better business decisions through actionable insights. Let's dig in. Well, hello again, everyone. Welcome back to The Dirt. Hope you're enjoying Season 2. We're just getting Season 2 underway. This is going to be our second episode of Season 2. And it's corn planting time, at least down here in the South. I've seen planters rolling for a a couple of weeks now, and that's going to continue moving further north as the temperatures warm up. I know some of you are still covered with ice and snow these days and think corn planting will never get here, but it's going to warm up pretty soon. To help us get in the mood of planting corn, I've got two guys with me here today that know a little bit about growing corn. I've got Fenton Ure with Nutrient Ag Solutions and Heath Kutrell. Heath is a corn grower in Southern Virginia, and I'll let him tell you a little more about himself. This year, Heath won the award for having the highest yield in the country for corn growers, and I'll let Heath tell us a little more about that. Heath, if you will, introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little more about you. Hey, I'm Heath Cutrell. Uh, I farm, like he said, in southeastern Virginia, northeastern North Carolina. We farm close to about 5,000 acres. We do about a third split rotation on corn and soybeans, and we farm a little bit of wheat as well. And Fenton, if you would, introduce yourself to our listeners. I'm Fenton here. I manage the nutrient location in Shawburn, North Carolina. Been working for nutrients since 2009. Been working with Heath now since pretty well about 2012 off and on, but exclusively the last three or four years he and I have worked together. Yeah, that's pretty much where we're at. I first met Fenton probably 10 or 12 years ago. We were at a trade show trying to promote some products and got to know him and worked with him off and on quite a bit over the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, really good agronomist and knows his stuff. Uh, just met Heath a couple of weeks ago. We were in North Carolina at the Commodity Conference, and everywhere I looked, there was Heath, and he had a group of people surrounding him. It seemed like he was a pretty popular person. I started asking some questions and found out that he had won the High Yield Contest. Heath, tell us a little bit about the, the contest and what your yield was. So we've been messing with this National Corn Growers Association since 2015, I had a friend introduce me to it back then, and uh, we had won for the state that year, and me being me, enjoying good competition, it wasn't good enough, so we just continued on with it. And today, this past year, like I said, we won for the nation. Wasn't expecting to win for the nation. We knew we had a good national win, but it was exciting to know that we pushed forward over top of everyone else. And what was that final yield you had? It was a uh, final yield ended up being 394 bushels to the acre. 394 bushels. And I think that was a, an all-time record, wasn't it? It was for me, yes, sir. Was that dry land corn or was that irrigated? That was dry land corn. 394 bushels dry land. How in the world do you do that? What's your secret? Nutrient. More, <laughs> more luck than anything. But, you know, since 2015, I've been playing with, you know, any kind of nutrients, anything that we could think to put on it, throwing the kitchen sink at it every year. You know, snake oils that work, snake oils that don't work. But to be honest with you, uh, one of the very biggest things that we believe in and uh, use is ESN. We started using that as soon as they came out with it. They promoted it. We tried it on some wheat years ago, and we put it just about on every single thing that we put in the ground this day. Corn planting, we we understand that We've got to start off with a good stand, and that's that's something that everybody preaches. We've got to start off with a good stand. Fenton, what target plant population do y'all shoot for? Well, the normal target population in our area would probably run somewhere around 32,000. In these contest fields, we're pushing that up considerably to get there. To be quite honest about it, this past year when he got his stand, when he planted, it was probably the best seed bed that I've ever seen stands were unbelievable i mean i think every plant came up within 48 hours of each other and that was on 1500 acres i talked about that several times during the growing season about how even the, the plants came up in the population and i think that's a big key when we put this corn in the grain 
population is huge, but the big key to population, Mike, is to make sure that we get this stuff up evenly and in as short a time frame as possible. And that comes along with owning a case in a national corn planter. You were talking about population. Uh, he's right. I think most people do plant about 32,000, uh, but I've been at 38,000 on every acre of my farm now since about 2018. Well, you mentioned the case planter, and I'm not going to promote case over anybody else. I think there's several good planters out there, but I know you use the, the red equipment. But what else do you do to make sure you get that stand coming up uniform? I know things like soil temperature and moisture are important. What do you look for before you decide to go put that seed in the ground? So me personally, we'll start with obviously waiting for a little bit of dry ground, and we'll do deep tillage with rippers. Uh, we'll rip the hard pan up. We'll come back with a few pieces of tillage equipment and we'll end up coming final with a uh, field cultivator and a, a roller over the top just to kind of firm the ground before we plant the ground. I always say I know the seed beds right when I walk across the field and I feel like I'm sinking down to my ankles. Fenton, anything to add to that? He gets a good seed bed, but then the things that we do, we're using habitat as a pop-up fertilizer underneath the road in fur. And then we got a blend that we're putting on each side of the road, two inches away, we're dribbling it on the surface of some more starter. We also are putting out a good pre-plant fertilizer with N, P, and K for whatever we need. And we're shooting for any time we're crossing the field with nitrogen in a dry blend, that blend being at least 50% of the nitrogen coming from ESN. Benton, if you will, tell us a little bit about the base fertilizer program and what you're doing to make sure you get all the nutrients out there that crop needs. We come up with a blend about, I don't know what, six years ago, Heath, maybe, that we kind of liked and we're still soil testing, but most of the time we pay very little attention to the soil test when it comes to N, P, and K because we know what the plants are going to need. And our blend has been a, we're looking for about half of our total nitrogen in our pre-plant fertilizer. Of course, phosphorus needs, we put a little bit out in the pre-plant. Most of our phosphorus is coming in in the starter because the soils that we're dealing with are phosphorus-fixing soils, so we don't typically have a lot of phosphorus needs to begin with. We're putting about half of our potash, maybe a little bit than half of our potash out up front. And we're putting a lot of micros in our fertilizer. We're putting some boron in there. We're throwing some magnesium in there. You know, we, a lot of sulfur going in there as well. When you start talking about these yields, and I'll let him tell you what his farm averages are more, but, I mean, we're talking about these contest yields being up there in almost 400 bushels, but farm averages are very high as well. And so we put a lot of fertilizer under those crops. We're putting 38,000 plants through that acre right there, so it takes more to, to feed 38,000 than it does to feed, say, 28,000. And then we're coming back and we're top dressing this stuff with some more nitrogen and some more potash and some more magnesium. When we started top dressing these crops with those higher rates of magnesium, we were having problems every year with magnesium deficiency, and we've moved it around. We've figured out where that needs to go. The other big key part of our fertilizer program is we do a lot of tissue testing. We start tissue testing early, and we tissue test right on through until almost black layer. As long as we feel like there's a chance to push that corn in any way, shape, form, or fashion, we want to be sure that it's never having a bad day. I've got records going back five years on tissue testing, and we've learned a lot by looking back because... We see sometimes something happening year after year. The second or third year we see it happening. We're like, we need to change something. Because if we're seeing a problem with the tissue test, obviously we've already missed the opportunity. And that's my whole key is to not miss any opportunity at all to make a crop. And that's one thing I want to point out. that We get calls all the time and the crop looks bad. It looks yellow. Something's wrong with it. And by the time we get that call and get there and look at it, it's really too late to make a correction. I really like the approach of tissue sampling, whether you think you need to or not. You can pick up on things a lot quicker that way than waiting until you see a problem in the field. We start tissues testing pretty much about V3, and we keep a tissue test, like I say, right on almost a black layer. And like I say, you know, one year is great because like you said, Mike, when we get a call, uh, we go out and we take a tissue test and we see that we're deficient in boron or we're deficient in magnesium or we're deficient in whatever. 
we've already lost yield potential. Now, I'm not saying you can't correct it at that point and, and make a crop out of it, but you're never going to make the highest crop that you can. And that's one thing that every person that I've ever heard in the NCGA yield contest say, to make high yields, you got to let that crop never have a bad day. It's never got to want for anything from day one. That's right. We're talking a lot about nutrients so far, but in my part of the world, one of the big limiting factors is water. And it just amazes me that you can grow that kind of corn on dry land conditions. So obviously, you've had a lot of rainfall during the year, but that's kind of a catch-22. You've got to have sunlight to keep that plant growing as well as the rainfall. How does that work out, Heath? How do you get enough rainfall and keep the sunlight there at the same time? Our water table is so high, you could actually take a spade shovel, dig two foot deep, and watch water trickle into the bottom of it. That's a big key that a lot of people don't understand. Yes, we're dry land, but at the same time, a lot of the land that I work, the water table is so high that it's almost self-feeds it. Now, naturally, this past year, we did get dry in July and got hot, but as a all-in-all -all kind of deal, we pretty much do okay as far as our water situation. We most of the time fight water, trying to get it away from the plants than we would actually trying to look for water. We're 20 minutes from the coast, so... Water, most of the time, isn't the issue. One way or the other, it would be harder for us to get it away. So our ditching system, we got to stay clean and uh, make sure that everything is able to move out instead of come in. We have a similar issue in the Mississippi Delta. We irrigate these crops and try to get the water on them, but you also have to get that water off in a timely manner, too. It's kind of a catch-22 situation. Fenton, we've talked about fertilizer, we've talked about water and the need for water. What else does this corn crop need? How else are you managing this to ensure these high yields? Well, Mike, one thing that we really believe strongly in is keeping somebody in the field scouting. We scout every two weeks. And then sometimes in between, Heath and I are in the field ourselves looking at things to see what's out there. The big thing that we run into year over year lately has been stink bugs. And so we're really out there looking for stink bugs and making sure we don't get any damage from the stink bug out there. When we put on stink bug applications, and that's an annual thing nowadays, it's pretty much become a standard practice. We're also putting fungicides on this corn. You know, he said we don't have much of a water problem. We either got too much or not enough, but it seems like when he's deep tilling like that, he's breaking through, we're getting water from the bottom side up a lot of times. One thing that we do have a lot of problem with is heat. So the fungicides help reduce the stress on the corn. And we've been able to, he and I, back in the first week of August this past year, we were talking about how bad the corn looked and how heat stressed it was and how dry we had been. And, you know, it just wasn't no way it looked like we were going to make a big yield this year. And when the combine rolled in the field, we were pleasantly surprised, which walking in the field doing what we did, I'd already told him pretty much where I thought the yields were going to be at. And it don't always work out, Mike. This corn crop is usually planted over by 15 miles. So from the bottom of his farming operation to the top of his farming operation, 15 to 20 miles. So this past year, the northern corn got water just at the right time. And when I say got water, I mean, we're talking about two, maybe three tenths of an inch of rain. But it just kept the heat down inside that crop enough for it to get pollinated. The southern part of the crop, it fared a lot worse than that. It didn't get the rain when it needed it. So we're trying to mitigate stress anywhere we can. We also looking at a lot of foliar products that we can put on the corn that will help feed it through the leaf too. Obviously, corn plants very, very structured very, very well, but when you start pushing these yields up to where we're looking at these yields going, um, you can put all the nutrients in the grain, but you just can't get enough nutrients into the plant through the root system a lot of times. We're dependent on putting it over the top as well. Benton, one of the things that both of you have mentioned, and I guess this question can go to both of you, you both mentioned using ESN in this program. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, maybe some of our listeners haven't heard of that and why you think ESN is helping so much in this production system. I'll take the lead on this one. A few years ago, Mike, we did a test with a grower of ours with Heath, but it was another grower. And we didn't change the, the total nitrogen applied. We just changed how we were putting it out. Well, we didn't really change how we were putting it out. We just changed the product we were putting it out with. When we went over the top with the, our over the top program, the growth standard was to put it out with a urea or something of that nature. And we went with ESN on part of the field. We went with the urea on the other part. 
That particular grower won the North Carolina yield contest that year with a yield of 295 bushels to the acre. He bested the standard program by 40 some bushels. So talking to Dr. Ron Heiniger and he doing some of the mathematics with everything, we figured it out that we didn't put any more corn on the stalk at the time. What we did is we actually filled the grains out fuller. Some of that corn was coming back with 64, 60, 64 and a half pound test weight. So what that told me was we need to keep the nitrogen in the plant longer to be able to get full potential. With ESN going in like we do over the top of, of Heath's corn, we're actually giving that corn a lot of nitrogen that's gonna be out there because if the ESN works over a period of time. It's a polymer coated product. It has microscopic pores in it and it takes temperature and it takes moisture to get it to release to the crop. So it's not laying out there volatilizing or running off or anything like that. It's just waiting for the corn to need it. And the good news about it is the polymer coating releases the nitrogen pretty much on the same temperature and moisture curve as the corn growth curve. So we're not releasing a bunch of nitrogen out there for it to lay there and wait. We're releasing it and it's getting taken up pretty quick when we're putting it out there. I'm a big firm believer in ESN on any kind of a crop that needs nitrogen that it will feed longer and utilize more of the uh, nitrogen we're putting out there. I've seen all kinds of studies, but if you put like a, a urea out there, they say you probably only get like 60% of what you put out there. I think with ESN, you're probably looking at more like 90%, yeah, yeah, that, not 100%. And they say what, 30% will volatize yep. from urea versus ESN where it'll stick right there, use up just about every inch of it. Well, that's what we want to hear. Anything we can do to protect that nitrogen investment, especially as much as that nitrogen's costing these days, we want to keep that nitrogen in the field and make it available for that crop to use. Yeah, Mike, and the other thing about that whole deal is if we're keeping it in the field and we're using it up, we're protecting the environment. We're not putting it down the ditches into the streams and the waterways. And so I think that's a huge, huge win for the environment as well. That's exactly right. Now, Heath, you mentioned that you're growing about 5,000 acres. Is this yield contest field? I know a lot of these guys, they'll pick out one or two fields and really shoot for high yields in one field and then the rest of the crop they just form it like everybody else. I understand you do things a little different on your operation. Yes, we try to treat every acre the same at the beginning, and then what we'll do is we'll walk around or look around, see where what we think is gonna be the best corn, and we'll figure it out along the way, and then that's when we'll start throwing a little more what we think the best corn is gonna be. We'll do it that way along with, like this past year, like he said, we were getting a little rain north of our farm, we had already been in there. We knew it was really good corn, magnificent corn. We had a place in North Carolina where we thought we were gonna have really good corn, but as we know, we had a lot of heat and a lot of drought in North Carolina, so we just kind of washed that away. But all in all, we'll, like I said, we're trying to treat everything the same until we get closer to the end, or we know where we got a perfect stand or just anything that's leading up to that. Now, early on, you mentioned that, that you tried a lot of snake oils or some that did work, some that didn't. Are there any of those, quote, snake oils that you want to talk about? What kind of products are we talking about? Which ones may work? And what have you found that doesn't work? He's my pencil man, so I'm going to let him tell you what. I do know what works, but, I mean, he's the one that pushes the product. So. We talked a little bit about Levitate earlier in fur, and I think that's a real game changer in getting the corn out of the grain evenly is to have something in fur. So that's been one of our really go-to products for a good while now. The second thing that we do is we use Radiate. That is a great product. It's strictly a, a growth hormone that just regulates the uh, root growth and promotes root growth. Beyond that, we've tried a lot of other things. And Titan. We use Titan on all of our fertilizer. Every acre gets Titan on the dry fertilizer. When we put the, the nitrogens out, we try to put a nitrogen stabilizer on the urea to help stabilize that. And we do use urea along with the ESN as well. And we also use ammonium sulfate to get sulfur into the mix. We try to balance it out so that we put all the urea out there, but we get some stuff out there that'll work fast. And then we get the ESN out there that lasts longer. We do all use nitrogen stabilizers on all of our nitrogen products, except for the ESN. We don't put that on that. He's tried some stuff, third-party stuff. Some of it's worked, like he says, some of it doesn't. We're going to be kind of quiet about what those products are just because uh, some of it we don't want to 
tip our hand too much on. I understand. I understand. So he, you've mentioned that Fenton brings you ideas, and he, he really works with you hand in hand to, to make this process work. Uh, what's the craziest thing he's ever came to you with and said, hey, let's try this? And did it work or didn't it work? I got to be honest with you. I don't think he's ever brought anything too crazy to me. He knows I don't do crazy. <laughs> Everything that he brings to me, well, let me back up. I'll say this. I trust him just as if he was my older brother, a lot older brother. He's a great guy to work with. I can't think of anybody else I'd want to work with. And when you create a relationship like that with someone, that means a lot. And especially the guy that you buy your fertilizer from. I mean, you got to really trust that guy and that company. With that being said, he doesn't come to me with any kind of crazy thoughts. And we'll sit down and talk about what he wants to do. We've been in this program so long now that we kind of know what's been working, what hasn't been working. We're just tweaking now. That's all we're doing. There's, you know, we're not getting big bushels anymore outside of what we've been doing. I think we were increased our bushels by what, three or four eight bushels this past year versus last year. That's the, you know, we, we are throwing the kitchen sink at it now. Um, this past year, you're talking about different things that we did. We tried chicken litter. Did it work? Yeah, that did work. That gave us a few extra bushels on that particular farm. But as far as getting to the top end of our corn, I think we're there. We just got to fine tune everything from here on out. And maybe there are a few more additives that we need to find or look at and place in our program. Yeah, Mike, on that same topic, the long-term goal for us we started was to get 400. And, you know, we're four bushels away. What's 2023 going to bring? We don't have any clue. I mean, since uh, it came out that he won the national this year, I probably fielded 25 calls from folks saying, tell me what this guy's doing. And I said, man, it ain't about what he's doing. He's in a part of the world that most people, I mean, you go to, say, to the western part of North Carolina, they don't have the water table that we have. That's a huge thing. He works some of as good a land as there is anywhere in north, in the eastern part of the United States. I mean, he's on some really good soils. Are they spectacular as the soils out in the Midwest? No, we're far from that. I mean, we're dealing with maybe six inches of topsoil in a lot of places where, you know, they probably deal with two foot out there. But it is really good land. The thing that we're still looking at now is fine tuning, as he said. I think it's going to be small things. He and I were talking the other week. We're going to look at playing around with our fertilizer rates a little bit on some things. Maybe we can trim some cost out of this program and keep the yields where we're at, looking at some data that we've seen this year in some of the, the winter meetings. I'll say that that's a huge thing that we do. We attend a lot of meetings throughout the year, he and I both, and we look at everything. We analyze it. and Some of it we use and some of it we don't. Some of it we talk about and we tweak on it. There's a few new products out there. Maybe we can get another two, three, four bushel yield out of this thing. Who knows? And we've got a couple of ideas for this year already. We, we've, already we've already got a couple of ideas that we're going to look at this year to see if we can push it, get it where we want to be. But, I mean, he and I have talked about it several times. The sky's the limit. Where can we go on this yield? I mean, we know there's been some yields out there in the five and 600 bushels, but I think in reality, the 400 for us is going to be a pretty top day based on where we're located and the conditions we're growing in. So. And damn proud of 400. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of proud of that 396. <laughs> and I know a lot of people that are jealous of that kind of yield would love to be able to get there. Guys, we really appreciate you being on and sharing a little bit of your success with us, telling us some things we need to watch out for and things we need to look for. What we kind of do here at the end now is we've started a new section and we're talking about famous agronomists or famous people that have contributed to agriculture. And today we're going to talk about somebody that's really changed the corn world. Have either of you ever heard of uh, George Harrison Shull? Yes, sir. That's a name you may have heard way back in college there, Fenton, but I had to go back and do some digging to find out everything about him. But he coined the term heterosis back in 1914. And for our listeners, what heterosis is, combining two different parents to make a hybrid offspring. Now, we know that all of our corn grown commercially today is a hybrid. And by doing this, George Skull was able to increase yields 25 to 50 percent per acre now, he first described this back in 1908. He made his first crosses, but it was about 10 years later before the first commercial hybrids were released. 
But during his career, he develops a bunch of hybrids. He won numerous awards. He founded the Journal of Genetics in 1916 and acted as the editor of that for about nine years and as associate editor for many years after that. In 1940, he was honored with the DeKalb Agriculture Association Medal. And in 1949, he was honored with the Marcellus Hartley Medal of National Academy of Sciences. One fun fact about this, Benton, you're probably old enough to remember this movie, the movie High Time with Bing Crosby. That's a little before my time, but there was a reference to George Shull in that movie. This movie was about an older gentleman that went back to school to get his bachelor's degree, and he was studying with some of his younger fraternity brothers and asked a question, who discovered the process of heterosis? And there was a discussion about that in the movie. So we want to remember George Shull and thank him for his contributions to the corn world. With that, we're going to wrap up this episode. We want to invite all our listeners to tune in next time. We'll have another exciting episode. I think next week we will be talking about potatoes and what it takes to grow a successful potato crop. So until next time, this has been Mike Howell with The Dirt.